Today, I'm happy to present our work on uh, constructing a reference implementation of accessible human DNA elements. So if we look at the uh, human genome, it's organized uh, in the cell nucleus by way of this long chromatin fiber containing many, uh, many tens of thousands of genes, coding and non-coding, uh, that are each surrounded by uh, regulatory elements, such as promoters and enhancers and so on and so forth. And even though the majority of the, of the chromatin is typically very tightly packed by way of just nucleosomal structure, there are regions that are uh, that, that are that become opened up, become accessible. Uh, for instance, for uh, DNA uh, DNA binding factors such as transcription factors to bind there. And so, these little pieces of DNA that become accessible for transcription factors to bind, or in other words, regulatory DNA, can be detected using an enzyme called DNAs1. Essentially, what DNAs1 does is, whenever a piece of chromatin becomes accessible, it's able to just cleave it. So it just cuts it. And the result of that is a large number of uh, small DNS1 fragments. These fragments, we can sequence them, compare them, and map the five prime into the genome. And as a result of that, we get this, these sort of pile-up tracks of where these, where these fragments um, map to. And so whenever we see a, uh, whenever we see a peak in these, uh, these piled-up fragments, it basically tells us that that area was accessible in that particular cell type. And so these uh, these, these areas of, of, of read enrichments we can detect, uh, and we call them DNAs1 hypersensitive sites, or DHSs. And so often these regions are indicative of, of, of regulatory DNA. Um, the problem really is that even though you can do this for an individual cell type, for an individual cell type, in general, in regulatory genomics, we simply don't have uh, any kind of common coordinate system, let alone a pragmatic limitation to further analyze these, um, uh, these elements. And so in that sense, it's, it's, it's quite a difference from, for instance, the world of gene annotation, uh, which, is, which is way ahead of uh, regulatory genomics in that, in that sense. And so in order to start addressing this problem, we decided to do a survey of chromatin accessibility across more than 400 different cell types and states uh, by way of doing uh, DNA seq in more than 700 um, human biosamples. And so these are uh, these are really collected across the, across the human body, across all major organ systems. And just to give you a little taste of what these data look like for a small region of the genome in only a small subset of, of, of hematopoietic cell types, I'm showing you this figure here. And you can already see that there's a huge, very, uh, very complex and, and varied patterning uh, with which these elements occur or do not occur across different cell types. And so the challenge here for us is to come up with this common coordinate system in which we can uh, we can we can consider these uh, these DHSs, and so we've come up with a with a quite simple um, computational method of of achieving this, um, and which really uh, which really basically boils down to uh, detecting peaks in individual data sets, along with an estimate of where their uh, most likely summit position is. So we end up with more than seventy five million of these of these peaks, then basically projecting all these summit positions down onto the genomic axis. <clears throat> to identify isolated uh, accessibility events, and then going back to the full width of each of these uh, of these peak positions to come up with the so-called consensus delineation of where uh, the likely start and end positions of these elements are. Uh, and to give you an example of that for this for this particular DHS here, uh, zooming in a little bit, we see that we have for for this element a start position, an end position a centroid position, which is basically the consensus summit across all, all these uh, individual peaks, uh, along with a so-called core region, which uh, captures 95% of all the, the summits across uh, uh, data sets. And so what this core region tells you is essentially how well positioned the DHS is, how, uh, what the positional stability of that element is. And to give you an example of, of an element that's a lot less well positioned, I'm showing you this example on the left here, where we see that these, um, these DHSs detected across different cell types really are much more dispersed, but also they're much more skewed uh, to certain, certain different directions. And so as a result of that, even though we can still confidently assign a start and end position to this element, the core region or positional stability um, uh, is, is much less well-defined. And so uh, we further uh, assign uh, several quality scores and confidence, uh, confidence metrics to these elements, as well as a unique identifier that uh, generally tells you where the element uh, is in the genome. So this element is on chromosome 14, roughly 88% of, uh, of, the, of the chromosome length. Uh, 
Um, and it also, the, the length of the number roughly tells you about the, the general density of other DHSs in that area. And so it's actually an interpretable um, uh, identifier. Uh, now that we have that common coordinate system, we can construct matrices like these, where we basically describe the accessibility pattern of three and a half million DHSs for the 700 plus uh, DNA seq data sets. So here, what you see is uh, if something is black, it means that the DHS is accessible in a particular cell type. And so what you see here is a lot of signal on the diagonal, which is what you would expect, right? There's a lot of elements, regulatory elements, accessible elements that really only um, are, are active in a, in a small subset of, um, uh, of, of cell types or cell states. And, and even though that's, that's generally the case, we also see a lot of off diagonal patterning here. So for instance, here, we see, a, we see a large group of DHSs shared across a large group of different cell types. But also, for instance, here, uh, we really see that there's a complex cross data set patterning where uh, you know, tens of thousands of DHSs really share a quite similar accessibility pattern across cell types that are really quite diverse. And so in order to start addressing the problem of categorizing all these accessible elements, in order to work towards a uh, hopefully pragmatic and useful annotation, we decided that doing a regular sort of hierarchical clustering on this uh, is not gonna be the way to, the way to do this. Uh, instead, we realized that we should really regard this, uh, this matrix and, and sort of decompose it um, into separate components. And so that's what we've done uh, using uh, non-negative matrix factorization. And essentially what, 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 what that does is it takes this matrix of three and a half million elements versus 700 data sets and sort of summarizes it in terms of 16 components. So here each component is given a single color and you see that each of the three and a half million DHSs is made up of either a single component or a mixture of components. To give you a few examples of, of this, here we have an example of a DHS that really uh, is very pri is primarily annotated in the, in the yellow component. Here we have a, uh, DHS that's annotated in two uh, components, orange and red. And then on the far uh, end of the spectrum, we have DHSs that show up across all or nearly all uh, cell types and are therefore represented by a rich mixture of essentially all components. Uh, to give you a little bit more intuition on what this looks like compared to the actual real DNA seq data, I'm showing you here for every component the, the, the DNA seq data set that is most strongly associated with it. And so for here, for instance, in the first example of the yellow uh, DHS, we see that it, indeed it shows up cleanly in, in a trophoblast cell type, but really not in any of the other component associated data sets. And so uh, in a more complex case, such as this one, where we see orange and, and red component, uh, indeed it shows up in data sets associated with the orange and red component, in this case, uh, T cells and, and um, uh, hematopoietic stem cells. Again, on the far end of the spectrum, we see this DHS that is annotated by uh, a rich mixture of all components. And indeed, it, it, it shows up across all these different uh, uh, data sets. And so this is, this is just the, you know, the top one data set associated with each, with each component. Uh, in the paper, we, uh, we, describe, uh, you know, we describe a further analysis where we extend this to the top 20, top, top 50 um, uh, data sets. And we really see that these patterns are quite, are quite consistent in the sense that the orange component seems to be capturing a lot of T cell or immune cell related uh, data sets, the, the green component, a lot of cardiac related data sets and so on and so forth. Now, instead of describing every DHS, instead of this, uh, in terms of this whole spectrum of, of components, for simplicity of downstream analyses, we summarize each element just by its um, uh, dominant component. And so now what we can do complementary to analyzing the, uh, uh, the characteristics of the, of the cell types associated with each component is we can also look at transcription factor motif enrichments <clears throat> in these DHSs uh, associated with a particular component. And if we do that, we also see a, a quite a strong uh, consistent pattern of, of known transcription factor uh, motifs uh, known to be associated with, uh, with particular cellular context. For instance, GCM1 is an important placental factor, uh, the IRF family, of course, heavily related to immune response and so on and so forth. And so using the information we get from the, uh, the biosample dimension together with the DHS dimension, we can come up with this uh, initial, um, um, probably not perfect, but hopefully useful labeling of components. 
So that gives us this situation where we now have an index of three and a half million DHS elements richly annotated and uh, carefully described in terms of how they occur across all these different cell types. And then secondly, also a DHS vocabulary that assigns every one of these elements to, uh, uh, to, a, to a regulatory component. Now this is a large, large data set and it's hard to sort of comprehend what that, what that looks like. And so the only way to so really make sense of, of these types of data and this holds, holds in general uh, is to look at it. Uh, modern browsers uh, are not always well equipped to look at this, uh, this amount of data, and particularly if you consider the entire uh, amount of raw, raw data, and therefore we developed our own browser based on the high glass system. Um, so this browser allows you to look around uh, all the individual uh, accessible elements with their, with their annotation, uh, allows you to trace back to the 16 component description of every data set. And even if you want to look at the raw, the full data set of, of more than 700 DNA-seq uh, uh, signals. You can do uh, uh, exporting of screenshots and actual also, uh, also the actual underlying uh, data. Uh, it's quite fast. You can zoom out to the gene level uh, or even if you so desire to the entire uh, genome. And so this idea of looking at regulatory elements in their context in the genome prompted us to sort of really look at the regulatory landscape in and around genes. So if we look at this small region on the, on, on the human X chromosome uh, around the GANA1 gene, we see that certainly these components, these colors are not randomly distributed. There's certainly some, uh, some patterning to this. In particular, if we zoom into this GATA1 region, we see that there really is an abundance of DHS elements that are annotated in the red or myeloid slash erythroid component. And of course, we notice that this is uh, directly aligned with the, with the well-described function of the GATA1 transcription factor. And so we wanted to test whether this generalized this. And so we just took all of GenCode annotated genes and systematically tested them for overrepresentation of particular uh, vocabulary components. So in this way, we could uh, indeed, like I already showed you, uh, assign GATA1 to the myeloid erythroid component, FOXP3 uh, to a lymphoid component, and so on and so forth. And this works quite well. Uh, for instance, here, if I'm showing you the top five uh, genes associated with the lymphoid component, uh, you know, they're all known to be associated with, with uh, 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 involved in immune response and things like that. The same holds for the myeloid erythroid component, which showing all these, uh, uh, all these genes very relevant for, for blood traits. Um, now, this patterning is even stronger for transcription factors, where, for instance, we see for the cardiac component that the top five transcription factor genes annotated with that component are essentially all of the cardiomyocyte lineage specifier uh, factors. Now, after looking at the regulatory landscape in and around genes, we decided to look at uh, uh, relevant disease-associated genetic variation. We already know that regulatory elements and, 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 and DHSs in general are strongly enriched for, these, uh, for, for this kind of signal. But now we wanted to see if like, adding in the component annotation really adds to that. And it turns out it really does. So we provided, we uh, performed LD score regression with partitioned heritability. Uh, basically splitting up uh, uh, variants uh, uh, and DHSs in terms of which uh, component they were annotated with. And we see that indeed for, uh, for, for uh, more than 260 uh, UK biobank traits, that there's a very strong association with uh, traits um, and relevant DHS components, much stronger so than uh, you know, the top three uh, sort of baseline, component, uh, baseline uh, annotations. And this is particularly true for these core region of the DHSs. Right? And this is something that uh, Jeff Fiestra will, uh, will, will speak to in more detail in the talk uh, after this one uh, concerning uh, DNA's footprints. Now, even though these elements, when they're, when they're annotated in the right component, they seem to be much stronger and enriched for, for the relevant genetic signal, we, still, we were still wondering on what that would mean for this regulatory landscape in and around genes. And so we decided to combine these two approaches and to really ask the question, given a gene and its, and its, and its uh, DHS landscape around it, um, would there be higher amount of genetic signal captured in DHSs that are annotated uh, uh, congruently with the annotation of the gene, uh, as opposed to DHSs that are annotated in a different component than the gene, right? So 
And this turns out to be quite strongly the case, uh, even when you compare it to intergenic or genic uh, control regions. Now, lastly, I uh, really think that these data could, uh, could represent the transition from a discovery era uh, to a detection era. Um, and indeed, we can, we can start extending uh, uh, this DHS annotation framework by just adding in new uh, newly generated data sets. I'm giving you a small example of that here. So the way we've constructed our uh, index and the vocabulary really allows for this uh, by essentially taking, in this case, new DNA seq data sets, um, processing them in a similar way and just projecting them uh, into the same uh, uh, non-negative matrix factorization space, if you will. So here I've taken, taken an additional 34 unseen uh, immune-related data sets and projected them into this space and they indeed fall into this uh, general area uh, of lymphoid component associated biosamples. And so this is, a, this is potentially a powerful approach because it means that these DHS bulk reference maps that we are describing here really can provide scaffolds for complementary assay data and for downstream analyses. Um, we also show that this is uh, even possible without explicit PCALs, which makes it very beneficial for, for instance, uh, single cell attack seek uh, data, which are often too sparse to reliably uh, detect uh, peaks de novo. And so the take home messages are, uh, that we provide this high resolution co common coordinate system as well as a component based annotation uh, that allow one to characterize the gene regulatory landscapes, uh, look at uh, disease associated genetic signals and hopefully integration of new single cell assay data sets. Uh, these are the acknowledgements for folks who generated all the data over many years, uh, were involved in the data analysis and data coordination, et cetera. Uh, the paper is available and of course the browser, uh, all the data in various formats and UCSC browser tracks as well. And then lastly, uh, just a quick announcement that we are hiring, looking for postdocs specifically. We're also interested in finding alternatively experienced folks if you don't have a PhD or have a PhD yet. If you're curious about the regulatory genome uh, and if you have affinity with squeezing information out of large data sets, then please get in touch. Thank you.